Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we are going to discuss the Intermediate Value Theorem. So in this topic we will review the Intermediate Value Theorem. We will look at some theorems that result from this Intermediate Value Theorem. We will look at applications of these new theorems with examples, and we will discuss how we will be applying these theorems in this course. You may recall the Intermediate Value Theorem from Calculus. You saw that if you had a continuous function f that was defined on an interval a, b, such as what we see here, and the values of f at a and f at b are different, then if you have any value of y between f at a and f at b, then there must exist an x between a and b such that y is equal to f at x. Now you saw the proof for this theorem in your course on calculus. Now in your course on calculus, you likely simply applied the intermediate value theorem to some examples to see how it works. We, however, are now going to apply the intermediate value theorem in a number of different situations when we prove that our numerical algorithms should actually work. So for example, given a continuous function f defined on an interval a, b, where f at a and f at b have opposite signs, then there exists a root x such that x is between a and b. And so therefore, the interval a, b has a root of the function f. Proof. Well, if f at a and f at b have opposite signs, then 0 is a value between f at a and f at b. Therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a point x where x lies on the interval from a to b where f at x is equal to 0. Well, if, if such a point x exists, then x does indeed have a root on the open interval a, b, and therefore there is a root on the interval a, b. Here's another example of a theorem we will use in this class. Given a continuous function f defined on an interval a, b, then the image of the interval under f is also an interval. Now, an interval is a contiguous set of points on the real line. The image of a collection of points is simply the collection of all images of all points in the original set of points. So if we were to evaluate each value of x between a and b and calculate f at x, then the collection of all f at x's would form the image of a b our claim is that all of these points must also form an interval that means they cannot be separated on the real line proof well we are going to use a proof by contradiction that is we will assume the opposite is true and by assuming the opposite is true, we will show that the opposite is not true. And consequently, our original statement must therefore be true. All right, so we will suppose that the image of the interval AB is not an interval. That means it's separated on the real line. Therefore, the image must be split by at least one value y such that there exists one point y sub l lower that is less than y and one y sub u or upper such that y is less than this upper value both of which y sub l and y sub u are in the image that's what it means for a collection to be split well if that's true 
that both y sub l and y sub u are in the image, then there must be points x sub l and x sub u in the interval such that f at x sub l is y sub l and f at x sub u is y sub u. But wait a second, either x sub l and x sub u or x sub u and x sub l must form a subinterval, uh, depending on which is less than the other. But in either case, the result is going to be a subinterval of the interval a, b. And therefore, because y is between y sub l and y sub u, therefore there must be a value of x such that f at x is equal to y, where x is in this smaller subinterval. But wait a second. Because x is in the smaller subinterval, it must also be in the interval a, b. And then therefore, y must also be in the image. That's a contradiction. Therefore, the continuous image of an interval is an interval. Here's another interesting proof. Suppose f is a continuous function on a, b, and we have two x values, x1 and x2, that are also in the interval a, b. Then there must exist an x in that interval a, b, such that f at x is equal to the average of the values f at x and f x sub 1 and f at x sub 2. Okay, proof. Well, f at x sub 1 and f at x sub 2 are both in the image of a, b under f. The average is a value between these two endpoints. From the previous theorem, therefore, there must be an x that satisfies the above condition. So here's an interesting theorem. Suppose that f is a continuous function on an interval a to b. F, of course, mapping the reals onto the reals. And we have n x values, x1 through xn, all of which are on or in the interval a to b. Then there must exist an x such that f at x equals a given convex combination of these values. That is, a weighted average with all weights being non-negative of these n values. Proof. Well, we saw previously that any convex combination must satisfy the following condition. Consequently, as both of the endpoints of this, these inequalities are in the image of f, f mapping a, b onto the image, there must therefore be an x in a, b such that the value of the function at that point equals that convex combination. That is, that weighted average of the value of the function at those endpoints with all weights being greater than or equal to zero. As an example of this theorem, suppose we have the interval 0, 1, and we have the nine points 0. 0.1 through 0. 0.9. Suppose also that the weights of our weighted average are these nine values, and if you sum them up, you will see that they sum up to the value 1. Now, the sine function is continuous, so if we calculate sine at each of the x values and then take the corresponding weighted average, we get that that weighted average works out to approximately 0 0.438 and change. Well, note that sine of 0 0.453397981 and change is approximately equal to this value. And this x value that we found is indeed between 0 and 1. 
Now, in general, we will only use these theorems to simplify expressions and simply determine that a specific value exists. We will not often be going out looking for specific values. Let's take an example. We just saw the Taylor series. So now f at x plus h is equal to this expression plus an error term. Xi plus is somewhere between x and x plus h. If I change the plus into a negative, the sign in front of the derivative changes, but that's it. However, now xi minus must be a value of x between x minus h and x. Okay. Let's sum these two expressions and divide by 2. So what this says is that the average value of f at x plus h and f at x minus h is equal to f at x with this more complex error term. Now that's looking a little bit ugly. And so it would be nice if we could actually simplify the error term. Well, if we take a look at this, this is simply the average value of the second derivative evaluated at two different points on the interval x minus h to x plus h. Well, from all of the previous theorems, we know that there must exist a value of xi such that the second derivative evaluated at xi is equal to the average value of these two value points evaluated at the second derivative. The only difference now is that this value xi must lie somewhere on the interval from x minus h to x plus h. However, we can now simplify the error to just say that it's a half the second derivative value at xi times h square squared, where xi lies between x minus h and x plus h. It's a lot easier to process a simpler error term than a more complex one like the one we started with. Let's see how we would apply this result. So we have that f at x plus h plus f at x minus h all over 2 is equal to f at x plus the second derivative evaluated at some point xi times h squared and xi is a value between x minus h and x plus h. Well, let the function be the cosine function, in which case the second derivative is the negative cosine function. Let x equal 1 and let h be 0 0.5. Well, with a little investigation, we see that this theorem is indeed correct. The average of cos of 0 0.5 and cos of 1.5 is cosine of 1 with the error at this point 1.303, all times 0 0.5 squared. And as we do note, yes indeed, 1.303 and change lies between 0 0.5 and 1.5. If we were to make h smaller, then this point xi would again be another point, but again it would be in that smaller interval. Following this topic, you have now reviewed the intermediate value theorem. You've seen a few theorems that are a consequence of the intermediate value theorem, and you've seen a few applications of these theorems and how these results will be used in this course. We've also shown a few examples. Here are the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!